you open your Bibles to James chapter 4, James chapter 4, first one to find it, stand up. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, we had the liberals this way, and we had the conservatives this way, and we had the moderates here who can't make up their mind. <laughs> but they found the verses pretty good, I should say that. Amen. Well, one did. There's always one. You can remain seated. James chapter 4 and verse 7 says this, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Lord, I pray now as we think about these uh, times, I, uh, I know that uh, to some it might be perilous times, uh, but God, we know that you have told us that these things would come to pass, and yet, God, it doesn't stop sin, and it doesn't stop the effects of it, and we still have to deal with it, but also, God, it doesn't uh, stop righteousness either and nor the peace of God that passes understanding, the comfort that you give us, and the great work that we have to do and the privilege we have of being a part of it. We thank you so much for your word, and we pray now as we guide our uh, uh, thoughts, that you would guide our thoughts, I should say, uh, that we would think about you and think about the things that are said, and um, to remember that we have a great work to do, and, and we know that we have an enemy. We have several enemies, but we have a, an enemy that desires to destroy our work. But Lord, we know that he has no hope of destroying um, the works of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we pray even now that we'll remember that. But yet, God, you've given us uh, tools and you've shown us what we should do. So as we rehearse these things in our ears, I pray, dear God, that you would help us uh, to just pay attention even for this short amount of time. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So, resist the devil. I guess you were thinking, well, what about a Memorial Day message? And that's, that's true. Um, but we, we have a work to do. And uh, we are very grateful for those who have given their lives uh, that we might enjoy the freedoms that we have. And brethren, we're in that work. We're in that work to resist the devil so that we can continue on the work to show people the way of everlasting freedom, everlasting liberty. Uh, from the freedom of, of, um, of sin. And so uh, we know that Jesus Christ is probably the, not probably, is in fact uh, the greatest warrior of all, uh, if you will, one who paid the, the price for our sins and we're very grateful for what he has done for us uh, on the cross at Calvary. I hope you're thankful for that and that uh, you don't ever get tired of saying, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And thank you, God, for the great price you paid for me on the cross at Calvary and to know that um, I know now, no matter what happens to me, that I'll be with you because of your great sacrifice. So I hope you're thankful for that. We have a great work, do we not? There's no question that we have a great work. This church has a great work. God didn't give this work to families. He didn't give it to homes. That's not what a home does. God didn't institute the home uh, to, be, uh, uh, to carry out the gospel message. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, that's, we do that. But God uh, specifically ordained churches, his churches, that would carry out this great work. And that's why Satan is so against it. Satan's attempts to destroy the great works of the Lord are great. <laughs> and they are, he's unrelenting. He's deceived himself, doesn't know that he's lost the battle. But brethren, what, we have to remember what Satan hates the most is the salvation of souls. He hates that the most. Why does he hate it the most? Or not why, I mean, how do we know he hates that the most? <laughs> because of his constant and unrelenting attacks on the people of God, and especially upon the churches of God. So we have to keep this in mind that an effective ministry is a targeted ministry. We can't forget that, that Satan targets those that he hates that are doing the greatest work for him. Those churches that are out there that are compromising the gospel, they're not much of a concern. Why should they be? Right? And those servants who are out, uh, call themselves servants of God that are heretics, what concern is that to Satan? He's won that battle. Nope. An effective ministry for the Lord is a targeted ministry. And within that ministry, the pillars of a church are targets as well. 
Why? Because we know that um, uh, everything rises and falls, as the scripture says, or as the uh, saying goes, upon leadership. And so if you can destroy the leader, isn't that, hasn't that been a great tactic of, of wars throughout history? Destroy the leader. Destroy the leader. Kill the king. Kill the commanding general. Kill the leaders. Why? Because they'll be like sheep. They won't know where to go. They won't know what to do. And so pillars of the church, those mature saints that have been given responsibilities, those that help in the decision-making process, those that counsel, those that lead, those that say, charge, full steam ahead. Let's keep the work of the Lord going. Those who say, here am I, send me. Those are the ones that are targets as well. Brethren, we cannot forget this truth, that salvation makes us safe in the family of God. In the family of God, brethren, we are safe. Nothing can destroy our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can destroy our relationship between God the Father and God the Son and daughters. Nothing can destroy that. It doesn't matter what kind of child we are. It doesn't matter what kind of child even you have. If they go astray, they're still your children. And you still love them. You still care for them. There's nothing they can do to not be your child anymore. And there's no righteousness they can do to earn to be your child. That's done by birth. Amen. And we're born again, and so we're safe in the family of God. But sin, brethren, affects the ministry of God. Therefore, Satan pushes our sin buttons. And endeavors to trip us in our weaknesses. Counsel and strict adherence to God's word and faith, brethren, are our weapons. Brethren must not become careless of the devil's work, nor of his manners. That's why James wrote to the churches. These were written to the, to the 12 tribes. It says in James chapter 1 and verse 1, verse, verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Think about this. Well, who are the 12 tribes? Brethren, they're not, not to be difficult to figure out. He's talking about the, to the, he's writing to the Hebrews. And they were scattered. Where were they scattered from? <laughs> well, where was James at? Jerusalem. And so well, who was he writing to? The, to, the, to the Hebrews that were scattered abroad. Abroad meaning where? Outside of Hebrew. Out, Hebrew. Outside of Jerusalem. Outside of Judea, perhaps. And beyond. He wrote a letter to them. But brethren, we know where these letters went. They didn't go to the synagogues. That's not where the book of James went to the synagogues. Maybe if Christians were meeting there, they might have gotten it. Neither did he just uh, have it sent, sent to the USPS to every, every mailbox. I'm being sarcastic and silly, but I'm making a point. Have you ever thought about that? Here this letter is written. How did James, after he penned the letter, where did it go? Well, I hope they find it. <laughs> you know, I'll send it by one courier, and I'll send it to so-and-so's house, and just pray God gets it everywhere else. That's not how the letters were distributed. They went to a church, and then that was commanded to be read by the church brethren, and then it was passed on to another church, or copied and sent to another church. So these, this letter of James, I think we can safely conclude, were sent to primarily churches that were primarily of the Hebrews, which probably were in Israel, in Judea, and in Samaria and other parts of Israel where the Jews gathered. That's probably where this, these letters were, this letter was sent and copied and sent to others. Nevertheless, however it was sent and however it got there, it got, into the, it got into their hands that James might encourage them this. Christians, not, Jew, not, uh, not um, the, uh, the Jews, but the Christians, Jews, if you will. Those who were not still practicing Judaism, but those who were, who were practicing the faith of Christ. He wrote, those letter, he wrote this letter to them. And he told them, Resist the devil. That's what he told them. And he will flee from you. So it is mindful, it is, it is 
of a truth that this is written just as much to gent for Gentiles as it was to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And James is not the only one that tells us to keep watch out for the wiles of the devil and the trickery of the devil. He's not the only one. Paul mentions it over and over again. Peter says, as a roaring lion, he seeketh about whom he may devour. It is a constant warning to us to watch out, brethren, be watchful. You're targeted. And you think to yourself, well, well I mean, it's the Lord's church. Why, why are we targeted? There, there is no answer for that. There's no solid answer except to say this, that it is a fact of our Christian lives that Satan is an active adversary. And for whatever reason God allows Satan, the, 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 the uh, degree of warring, only God knows. We don't have solid answers as to why that's still. Why does Satan? I get with man. I get the world, but why Satan? So it is a fact of, a fact of our Christian life that Satan is an active adversary. And let's be more specific against this church. So this is not going to be a totally negative message, mind you. But I just, we have to, and brethren, our church has in the past, is presently, and will in the future continue to endure and to battle against the attacks of the devil. And one brother, not too long ago, as we were in the midst of discussing some very grave things, reminded all of us, let us not forget what the devil's goal is and let us not get, forget that truth to keep our perspective right. That was a good reminder. It's a good perspective. It's good in marriages. It's good for the husband to say to the wife, time out. Let's not let this get to the point. Forget that. Who is behind this? Who wants to destroy our marriage? Satan does. Why does Satan want to destroy your marriage? Why does he want to destroy that relationship? So that you'll no longer be an effective witness. Although God makes beauty out of ashes, we understand that. And we know what God can do, but we, cannot, but we can avoid those things if we'll resist the devil. And the Bible says he will flee. Not he might, or eventually, he will. But it's called resisting. So in order to, you know, the, the best offense in a battle is to know, obviously, or to judge or to discern what's the enemy going to do. Ah, they want us to think they're going to the, they're going to flank us to the south. But I know them. I know how they battle. They're just going to send a decoy there and they're actually going to flank us from the east. Know your enemy. And so we need to be reminded of how the devil works. And brethren, it is not with guns and, and airplanes and uniforms where he is just easily discerned. Nope. He's subtle. And he's deceptive. So let's just take a brief look at just, uh, first of all, uh, Satan's work, his work. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. This is the, the area that Satan, his primary means of attacking. And that is through temptations. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. We better start in verse 1. Now the serpent was more, what does that next word say? Subtle. Subtle. That's important. That's the first mention of the character of Satan. Did you see that? The first mention of Satan's character, God made it clear. We, didn't have, we don't have to figure it out. God said this is exactly the way he is. He is subtle. And he's more subtle than any beast of the field. 
which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, the serpent, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Here it is. First mention of what the devil does. What have you learned by God? And I'll correct it. Do you get it? What did God tell you to do? And I'll tell you where God has erred. Tell me what the Lord said. And I'll tell you the Lord's not being truthful with you. Isn't he not swapping the place of God? That's what he endeavors to do. He's subtle. He takes God's word and, he's, and he corrects it. He tries to usurp it and tries to convince us that what God has said doesn't fit our lives. It doesn't make sense. It is unreasonable. But let me just tell you this. Look at that again. She said this. God said if we eat of it, and she had to touch it, but God said if we eat of it, we'll shall, we shall die. That's big. Not, <laughs> you'll lose your job. That's big. But dying's bigger. Does it not increase the temptation to do wrong? My death? Compared to losing money? I'd rather lose money <laughs> than to think that I would die. And so Satan says this, you're not going to die. You can eat it, you're not going to That is ridiculous. That's ridiculous to think that a loving God would send anyone to hell. It's ridiculous. God is, God is not like that. Right? That's what it's like. That's what people are like. If it wasn't for the Lord, I'd be doing that today. If it wasn't for God's truth, that's the way I would behave. Because I, pride will do that to you. When it comes to God giving commands, God says, behave this way. This is the way victory will come. But the consequence of behaving righteously can be grave from man's point of view. But what will my spouse think? But what will my children think? What will my church think? What will my extended family think? What will my neighbors think? What will my boss think? What will my coworkers think? If I don't show up to their party? What will that, my, my child think if I don't let them go with their friends? What will my wife think? What will my husband think if I'm not going to partake, not going to be a part of that? Those are grave decisions, brethren, because it might separate you from people or, or, or make people look at you differently than what you wish, want them to think about you. That's the subtlety of Satan. Amen. So the first mention is key to our understanding of Satan's means. Subtle. And he usurps, he's endeavoring to tell us how we ought to behave and how we ought to live our lives. Contrary to God's. He tempts us to disobey God. You know, we're not alone in this. Jesus Christ was subject to all of this, just like you and I were. Mark 4, Matthew 4, 1. Then was Jesus led up in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us this, that Jesus Christ was tempted in every way like you and I are. And were. And will be. <laughs> Christ was tempted in every way. Tempted to disobey his parents. Tempted to disobey authority. Tempted to uh, 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 live by his reason. 
tempted by people coming around him and, and pleading with him and, and trying to get him to do things he ought not to do. They wanted to make him king of Israel. They wanted him to be the king right then and there, but Jesus Christ knew it wasn't time. Tempted his pride. Satan did that. He was tempted in every way, brethren, like you and I were. So Satan tempts. That's what he does. Tempts us to disobey God and, and that by reason. He also opposes us. Turn to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. That's towards pretty close, going towards the end of the Old Testament. One of the longer of the minor prophets. Zechariah chapter 3. Use your index if you need to. Now, without getting into the context of this, Zechariah 3 1 says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to do what? To resist him. So, that, uh, we can see that throughout the scriptures that Satan is, uh, opposes the righteous. He opposes those who are standing at the right hand of God. Joshua was a high priest. And, and there was Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord was ministering to Joshua. And there was a spiritual battle going on that you and I can't see. And Joshua couldn't. But Zechariah, God gave him a glimpse of that. And, he, and God was showing Zechariah, this is the spiritual battle that's going on. And here's the high priest who's righteous before God. And this Joshua was a good priest was a righteous priest, did right. I'm sure he had his problems, and maybe Scripture reveals that, but nevertheless. And there's Satan resisting him to keep him from doing what God has called him to do. Satan opposes the righteous, those who are right with God. But 2 Corinthians 5.21 says about Jesus Christ, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So if Joshua, the high priest, who is righteous, Satan is opposing him, Satan indeed is opposing us because we have the righteousness of Christ. We are being opposed even today. Look at Job chapter 1 once again. We've been there many times over the last several months. Job chapter 1 exemplifies this, the spiritual battles that we endure. Just before the book of Psalms, I would have got some of those sword drills had Matt told me about where those books were. I thought 2 Samuel was in the New Testament. I was way in the wrong place. No, I'm just... Job chapter 1 and verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Verse 10, Job 1.10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hand and his substance is increased in the land. Here it is. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. So there is Job resisting, uh, Satan re, uh, resisting and oppressing, endeavoring to oppress Job. Right? That's what Satan does. He opposes us. Satan accuses us, the Bible says, continually before God. Now, how many of you wake up in the morning or throughout the day, and think about Satan at that time um, accusing you before God. I don't, I don't ever think of that. In Revelation 12, 10, it says this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength 
and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Here it is. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, if you ever meditate on that, I don't know that you will, but let's just say you desire to meditate on that verse for a little while. And you th ask yourself, and, and ask yourself, self, what does that look like when Satan is accusing the brethren night and day before God? What does that look like? So, God, the Bible Baptist Church down there in Stanwood, I can see they're, they're doing a work. They're determined to do whatever you say. Well, you just gave them that building. What else are they going to do? Of course they're going to be faithful to you. Right? Well, God, okay, so they celebrated, a, you know, 20-something years, and, and they think about that, and they think about all your goodness. I mean, you've just been so good to them. I'll tell you what, Lord, just take, take your hand. You wouldn't call him Lord. Take your hand away from them. You watch. They'll drop like flies. And they'll turn and just do their own thing. Go ahead, do that. Doesn't the Bible say he accused night and day? Doesn't it, doesn't it show us, and Job exemplify that, when God went before there and he accused one man? How many righteous were there in the days of Job? Just Job? I don't think so. But Satan mentioned Job by name. One man. Is that what he's doing? Mentioning our name, Bible Baptist Church or Stanwood? Our name, and he says, God, you've put your hedge about them. You just watch how fast they behave themselves like the rest. When I've moved you to take your hand away from them, you see what they did? Bible Baptists of Stanwood will do the same thing. Go ahead. Right? I mean, we don't think about that, do we? Or how about waking up in the morning and thinking that Satan is standing before God and says, well, there's Steve down there. Man, you put there in Pastor Bible Baptist Church. There he is praying. Every day he's praying. Every day he's reading his Bible. Look what you've done. Look at his house. Look at his wife. Sorry, I got that backwards. Look at his wife. <laughs> Look at his house, his children. Look at what he has. Go ahead. He's just that way because you've given him so much. You, when I'm talking like that right now, you're thinking to yourself, I'll bet, figure of speech, no. No, that, that's probably not really going on. He accuses us day and night. I don't know how he does that. I can assure you there weren't 10 people on the earth in the days of Job. Right? There was probably quite a few. And a lot of righteous people. Satan opposes us. What is our duty? God gives us our duty. In James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 9 says this, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast, here it is, in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Okay, a little rabbit trail. Notice what Peter said right here in uh, 1 Peter 5, 9. He said... The same knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Little rabbit trail. I, sometimes I, uh, when I talk to people, and, and, and I had to learn this too, and I get to see it more because of my position. I, I understand that. And the privilege I have of being able to work with people. But because I can't break folks' confidence, all I can say is to folks who feel like they're enduring something and they're pretty much all alone is that <laughs> you're not. 
And when folks, let me just say, I don't, I don't want to say foolishly, sometimes it's foolishly, but ignorantly look around and think that other families aren't enduring difficulties and other um, individuals aren't having a hard time. I have to be careful. I don't say things, but I, I just look and go, You're, that way of thinking is such an error. Such an error. Brethren, churches like us are enduring the same things we're enduring. It's called afflictions. Afflictions. And just because we're small, small doesn't mean that Satan's not interested because we're a small meal. Won't fill up his belly. <laughs> type of a thing. I know it uses it as a roaring lion, but as a roaring lion seeketh about who... Have you ever watched a, a, a documentary on lions and how they... You ought to do that. That'll help bring that to light. That'll give you more of a, a, vis, a visual of what Satan is doing. Subtle, right? In the high grass, being very still, waiting, waiting, waiting for the weakness of that prey to show itself and then pouncing. It's amazing. Or roaring to instill fear to make their prey fear and afraid, stand still, don't move, so they can attack. It's fascinating. I'm not an expert by any stretch of, uh, stretch of the imagination. But I'll tell you, it would help our spiritual lives. It would help you. It's so easy to do today, right? We have such access. Pull up something on, on the media and just watch a, a, a glimpse about how lions pray. Did I say that right? Does that sound Okay. How lions pray, how they go after their prey. That doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean. What's our duty is to resist. Resist steadfast. You know what that word steadfast means? Here it is. I'm not moving from the faith. I don't, I'm just saying this. This is the way you're really going to behave, but because I'm preaching and we don't have that much time, I'm just going to cut to the chase. I won't. I will not disobey. I'm not moving. I know it's harder than that. I'm just making a point. That's steadfast. I'm not going to do it. I love you. You mean everything to me. But I won't compromise. I won't do it. Like I said, you probably won't say it that way. I wouldn't say it that way. But, um, but I would want it to be. But that's what it means to be steadfast fast in the faith. What faith? The faith of who? The faith of who? Christ. The faith of Christ. Resist steadfast in the faith, which is identified the faith of Christ. It's that faith that Jesus Christ exercised when he was here on the earth that we have an incredible record of, of how Christ behaved himself what his desires were, how he answered the adversaries, not only Satan at the beginning of his ministry, but also from the world during his ministry, and of course the temptations that were opposed upon him uh, from his flesh, but he wasn't sinful, I get that, uh, that part, but he was still tempted, the Bible says. That's the faith we follow. Amen. And that's how we resist, by behaving and deciding our lives the way Jesus Christ has instructed us and exemplified and showed us in the scriptures. Resist by submitting to God, that is, his commands and his instructions and his purposes and so forth. Understand, brethren, that you and I are not alone in our temptations. Similarly, realize that many who endure the same afflictions have come out victoriously. Praise the Lord for that. That's why we need examples. Do you know how many relatively new churches need to look at churches like ours that are still enduring after 22 years? Do you know how many need to see our faith and how we need to see others like us? I mean, of our size and our ability and, and the strength that God has given to us. I can remember my pastor years ago, there was a, a regular annual meeting, I believe, and it was, 
it was, um, I think, I don't know if it was in eastern, uh, in uh, northern Oregon or southern Washington around there, but it was um, a, a ministry where, I mean, a meeting where these pastors would come who were pastors all of really small churches. And, and, and many of them had been pastors of those small churches 10, 20, 30, 40 years, working jobs the whole time, and yet still carrying out the work of the Lord. It was such an encouragement. I tell you, when I heard about I didn't know that was going on. He went away for a while, and he came back, and where'd you go? And he just gave a report on, on that meeting that he attends. And he was, I don't know if he was speaking one time or what. I, I, to this day, still think about those men because of what I heard through another man's testimony about how faithful they were to continue. And those churches, and the brethren, of course, the flock that they had the privilege of leading. God addresses our very issues. Look at Hebrews, uh, Hebrews, Ephesians. Robert, that's right after the book of Genesis. <laughs> Ephesians, that's so we can get there first. It's all right, if Tanea was here, she'd whip you. <laughs> for those of you, that was for a long time ago. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. Notice what the Lord says. Let's see. Verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 4 says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in your spirit of your mind. That, and that, ye put on the new man, which is after God. I read that wrong. And that you put off on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away, here it goes, putting away lying, speak every man the what? What's that, brethren? Truth. With who? His neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Here it is. Neither give place to the devil. So how is he going to cause us to lie? Or how is he going to move us to lie deceitfully? How is he going to move us to be, uh, uh, to be angry and sin not? To be angry, that is, to be malicious. That's why he said, neither give place to the devil. Therefore, stop lying, one, with the truth. Don't be malicious in your way of talking. When you're angry, make sure you're angry in the, for the Lord's purposes, not fleshly purposes. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. That's a great verse for marriages. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye, like, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. See what it says in verse 31? Bitterness and wrath. I want to challenge you or encourage you. Uh, maybe you won't do it today. Perhaps one of your devotions time, just say, oh yeah, pastor asked me to do what? Yeah, what was that? So you might want to write it down. Look up those words. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. Look those words up. You might want to use a strong. Uh, you could just use the English. But you might not find um, evil speaking uh, in, a, in a dictionary, a regular old Webster's dictionary or something. It might be good to look it up uh, in the strongs. Look those things up. Look up the word malice, what that means. Amen. So, God addresses our very issues 
of how the devil is, in verse 27, neither give place to the devil. So God deals with us and tells us those areas that are of the greatest temptation. Wouldn't you know it deals with the tongue most of all? Anyhow, our duty is to resist the devil in the faith. And we're supposed to enlist some help. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. Look what it says. Just turn the page there if you need to. You got a large print. Might need to turn a couple pages. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 we, says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the what? Wiles of the devil. That's that trickery of the devil. But you've got to put on the, the armor of God. When, this is not about putting on the armor of God, but um, it, it talks about that. But look what, this, um, look what confidence we can have in God's armor. Right? It's God's armor. God issued it. Right? What do you call that? Government issue? We'll call it the... Call it the what? The heavenly issue. There it is. And that is our, 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 uh, our, our armor. Now, what confidence can we put in this armor? Let's look just briefly at a couple of areas. When you don this armor... The helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the Lord, the breastplate of righteousness, girding your loins with truth, shining your feet. Do I get any points for that, Matt? Okay, he gave me some points for that. I didn't even look. I probably missed them. All right. Notice in verse 14, the first part, that there's strength in truth, because we have truth. Stand fast, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So there's strength in truth. What a weapon. There is strength in assurance that we are right with God. Look at the rest of 14. And having on the breastplate of what? Righteousness. It's a breastplate saying that it, it that reminds us that we're protected by righteousness. I'm doing the right thing. Remember when I was a kid, we used to play, you know, uh, war or what have you. When it was, uh, when we had to be indoors, and that didn't happen very much. We lived in San Jose, California. It was usually pretty, at this time, it was pretty sunny and warm there. But there were times we had to be indoors. And, and this is what we used to do. We used to um, uh, set up our rooms and we'd get the pillows up and we'd, chairs and anything else we can get and do you, you would take little pieces of paper and you would twist them so they're about a little quarter of an inch wide but twisted over several times then you can bend them little bullets and then you took a Aubrey don't listen and then you took a uh, a, um, a rubber band and you wrap that around the rubber band and you pull it back and you shoot the bullets at one I'll tell you those things stung so we would, we would make up our room so, uh, so that there'd be little, little holes like this big where we could just kind of shoot, shoot them out. And there'd be those white things all over the place because we'd, we'd spend a you know, half hour or so making a bunch of them up. But what, what happened was is when the, when the war started and those little white bullets started flying all over the place, when we ducked behind our barricade, we felt what? Safe. And then we'd have to think about when we're going to poke our head up or over, right? But you feel safe when you get behind something you know that's going to protect you. That's the breastplate plate of righteousness. Righteousness shields me from the adversary. That gives me assurance. I have comforted myself many, many times with God saying, am I doing the right thing? And it wasn't long ago. Steve, you do what you're supposed to do. And all is well. And when I have to be concerned about others, he reminds me they're supposed to do what they're supposed to do. You don't be concerned, you know what I mean, about what they're supposed to do, other than praying about it. But if you've done what you're supposed to do, amen, you're standing behind righteousness. You're in a safe place. And it brings peace. Just like those bullets trying to get me when I'm ducked behind the barricade. 
Play with that with Gabriel. Not. No, my mom never played. So there's strength and assurance. We're right with God. And there's strength and purpose because we're the ministers of God. Look at verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. There it is. It's not shod to go out there and make a living. Someone say amen. Our feet aren't shod to, be, to get out there and find peace and joy and liberty and happiness and, and the pursuit of happiness. That's not what our feet are shod with. They're shod with the preparation of gospel. And otherwise, in other words, we know what we're supposed to do. I know what I'm supposed to do. You know what you're supposed to do because your feet are shod with the preparation of gospel. You're ready to go out to carry the gospel message. You know what you're supposed to do. You can resist the devil steadfast in the faith when he tries to convince you to occupy your life and other things away from that call of God. That's what the armor does. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's where I'm supposed to go. That's where they're supposed to carry me. That is where my life is to lead me. And that is to get, as a messenger of God, to get the gospel out. There's strength and purpose because we're the ministers of God, as seen in the armor. And there's strength and victory, because we're the overcomers. Look at verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we, ye shall be able to quench, what does it say? All the fiery darts of the wicked. Not some of them. Not the ones that, weren't, that have a dull point. All of them. That's quite remarkable, don't you think? that everything the devil throws at us to destroy our marriages, to destroy our life, to destroy our church, to destroy our finances, to destroy our relationships, everything the devil throws our way, the Bible says the shield of faith will prevent. Isn't that interesting? What faith? It's the faith of Jesus Christ. Strength and victory. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. There's strength in truth, in assurance, and purpose, and victory, and there's strength in knowledge. We are his. Look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. I don't think that's very complicated. You put the helmet on. What does that remind you of? It's Protecting your, your mind, what you think. I belong to God. I'm saved. Brethren, there probably isn't one of us that hasn't struggled with this thought that there's something wrong with me. God is so distant. Am I really one of his? Where is God? No, I am one of his. The helmet of salvation reminds me that I belong to God. I'm a child of God. I'm a minister of God. So there's strength and knowledge. There's strength in, to engage um, with the armor because we have God's word. The second part of 17 says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we have strength to engage. In everything we do and every, every battle that we battle, we'll engage it by the uh, commands of God. And then lastly, there's strength and power. We have access. Look at verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for who? For all saints. So I want to just uh, encourage you in this and admonish you if this is not what you're doing now on a regular basis and that is praying one for another. So let me, don't do this just in your head. In your, just in your mind, look around the room in your mind and say this, have I prayed for Lizzie? Have I prayed for Tabby? Have I prayed for Seth? Have I prayed for Mrs. Rodenberger? Have I, get it? Have I done, when's the last time I prayed for them? Don't misunderstand me. It's not like you, you know, should beat yourself up because you don't pray for them every day, but when's the last time? This is what I do. Now I know, I know my position's a little different because of my responsibilities. You're going to laugh. <laughs> You're going to laugh. I go through the alphabet. 
Hey, ah, Auburn, you guys. You get most of my players because the time I get to I, I'm finished. <laughs> but I pray for the Aubergs. Yeah, then go the Blosses. Yeah. And then so forth and so on. That's what I do. And yes, I make it to the Repanitus. Right now, you, I think you're the last one on the alphabetical list, I think. But I get there. And when I'm praying, I pray for the families. That's how I pray for Aubrey. That's how I pray for Becky. Don't misunderstand me. It's not an everyday thing, but th that's what I do. I go through the alphabets. I know how important it is to pray one for another. I know that we need one another's prayers. And I appreciate so much when people say, Pastor, I pray for you. And I appreciate that. Once we put this armor on and commit ourselves to God, we have the right perspective, the right frame of mind, and our spiritual eyes open to watch thereunto for the attacks, wiles, and deceitful works of Satan. But I will remind you of this, that to don this armor is a choice you must make. Then lastly, Christ's victory. Christ's victory over Satan's bondage. Turn to John chapter 12 as we wrap up the message here. John chapter 12. Stay with me, please, with the Lord. John chapter 12 and verse 30. Jesus, the Father, had just verbally for the second time um, exalted the Lord Jesus Christ where others could hear. And Jesus said this in verse 30, Jesus said and answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So Christ's gospel defeated the works of Satan. Satan, therefore, has no more power over death. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Something to remind us that Christ has already won the battle. He's already been victorious. Every struggle you and I endure from the day of our salvation forward will end up in victory because of what Christ did on the cross at Calvary. The fear of death is why, brethren, there are... Oh, never mind, that's not important. I meant to cross that out. I thought to myself, why did I put that in there? And then lastly, uh, Christ's victory over Satan's bondage and over his work. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. Last verse this morning for you to look up, but not the last one I'm going to quote. Read. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. It's Christ's victory over Satan's bondage and over his work, which we already alluded to already. 1 John 3, 8 says this, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So no matter how much, brethren, we find a place where we find ourselves where we feel defeated, and we feel like there's no hope, and uh, I've gone too far, I've done too much, we can't forget this, that the works of the devil have been destroyed by Christ. Therefore, we sing that song, Victory Ahead. There's victory ahead. We have now the spirit of the living God. We, ha we have access to God. We have access to the power of God. There isn't one, if Christ can, has overcome all sin, which he has, if he has died for every sin, in your mind, put that in your head, in your mind, and ask yourself, name them in your head. Go ahead, lying, he died for it. Malice, he died for it. Pride, he died for it. And all the other sins that I don't need to mention, things that we think about or we know about, we don't need to go through those. Go ahead in your head, Sam, Christ died for them. 
And because he did and destroyed the works of the devil, and because we have the Spirit of God living in us, and because we have access to the power of God, he is the almighty God. And there isn't a problem that God can't overcome. He's already the overcomer. Christ's victory over the works of the devil. 1 John 4.19 says we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. We must be reminded in Revelation 1.5 and from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, let's stand together. Amen.